All right, thank you. <coughs> okay, hi everybody, shalom, I hope uh, you're well. And uh, first I want to uh, read off our dedications. Uh, we have the following special dedication by Rena and Mark Questel for the entire month of Adar uh, in appreciation of Rabbi Breidowitz and the Torah he shares as a zechuz for a refuah shleima for kol chol Yisrael and that Chodesh Adar, the little that is left, should still be filled with simcha for all of Am Yisrael. And of course, I would just add, it should carry over to Nisan as well, the month of Geula. Uh, registration to participate in the Yivane Pesach Seder is approaching. One can register by email to Pesach at uh, Yivane.com. And a link can be found for the Kimcha de Pischa Drive. 100% of the funds are distributed directly uh, to those in need. And there is a great obligation indeed to help uh, support uh, Aniyam. Uh, particularly for the holiday of Pesach. I also want to add as well that uh, we should still have our tefillos uh, for Dr. Eileen Citrin, Leah Bas Basha Hena. Again, I mentioned last week, this is a woman that I know very, very well for many, many years, a wonderful person, and uh, Kodesh Baruch Hu should uh, give her a refuah shleima, and we're thinking of her son Mark as well, that he should be, uh, he should be well, or Moshe, as he now goes, should be well. Uh, so now, uh, today, I'm going to take a little break off Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim because we do have a, a new Chumash that we're starting. And we are starting uh, Sefer Vayikra uh, and Parshas Vayikra. And for many, many people, this is the most daunting uh, of all of the Chamisha Chum Torah because it is the most technical. It is filled with the most halachic detail. It's the most difficult to just grasp what is going on. Uh, for those who enjoy, you know, intricate Gemaras, this is actually the, the favorite Chumash of people. It kind of reminds me a little bit. There's a very cute, uh, cute passage, and this is probably the first time and maybe the last time I'll ever use this as a Makor, in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. So Jane Eyre is a very precocious little girl, and she knows her Bible very well. Uh, but she says, I enjoy Genesis and some of the stories of Exodus. But by the time we get to Leviticus, it does not grab my interest. And yet, uh, what Jane Eyre said is something that you know, I think many of us might feel. But in reality, Chazal tell us that in the time of Chazal, when they would begin to teach children Chumash at the age of five, the Chumash they would begin with was not Bereshus. The Chumash they would begin with was Vayikra. Because they said, little children are pure, they have not yet sinned, and those who are pure should occupy themselves with those parts of the Torah that deal with sanctity and purity. Korbanos. Now, it's interesting that uh, the Chavitz Chaim, uh, in the late 19th century, was the person who actually popularized the relearning of the order of the Gemaras dealing with sacrifices for many hundreds of years. That whole section of Shas was largely in neglect. The Chavitz Chaim brought it back, Ad Kedei Kach, that although it's not the mainstream bread and butter in a typical yeshiva curriculum, but learning Kachim is like the most advanced type of learning. You do it in brisk, like if you go to the highest, most advanced yeshivas, they spend time on Kachim. And this is because of the Chavitz Chaim, who not only popularized it, but at his own expense, and he didn't have a lot of money, he reprinted old Svarim on Kachim, and he himself wrote his own compositions on Kachim. So someone asked the Chafetz Chaim, why do you spend so much time on the laws of Kachim, Korbanos? After all, it's not Nogeel Lemaisa, it's not practical. As if the Chafetz Chaim didn't care about practical halacha. He did the Mishnah Brewery, he did so many works on practical halacha, but so many people like to complain. They said, why are you wasting your time on things that are not practical? And the Chavitz Chaim gave two interesting answers. Answer number one is, if you truly believe in the coming of Mashiach, you don't just say it as a pious statement. You really, really believe that Mashiach can come tomorrow. 
and there'll be a Beis HaMikdash tomorrow, then why do you say it's not relevant in Misa? It certainly is. Okay, uh, right now, today, Tuesday, there is no Beis HaMikdash. Maybe Wednesday there is. I better know the Halachas. So the Chavitz Chaim says, anyone who does not learn Kachim because they say it's not relevant to practice is truly not believing in the coming of the Mashiach and the building of the Beis HaMikdash. That's point number one the Chavitz Chaim made. But then he made another point. He said, you know, and I think we talked about this uh, even a few weeks ago, just to go over it very quickly. We know that the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah correlate the bones and the sinews of the human body. The 248 positive commandments, thou shalt do, correspond to the 248 bones. The 365 negative commandments correlate to 365 sinews or ligaments and the like. And every time you do a positive commandment, it gives spiritual vibrancy to a particular bone. Actually, it means the spiritual counterpart of that bone. And every time you violate a negative commandment, you're impairing the spiritual essence of a particular ligament. Although we don't really know how to match the mitzvahs to particular bones. So the Chavitz Chaim says, when you have mitzvahs that you're not able to fulfill, then by definition, you're impaired. By definition, something is happening to you. But if you learn about the mitzvah, even though you can't do it, you get the light of the mitzvah. And that's why it's important to learn those parts of the Torah <coughs> that are not only relevant to my practical life, but Badafka, those things that are not directly relevant to my practical life, because that is the only, the only way my neshama gets fed the light of that particular mitzvah. I mean, I'll give you one example to show you that it has to be that way. You know, one of the 248 mitzvahs in the Torah is that if a man wants to divorce his wife, he has to give a get. Now, if the 248 mitzvahs correspond to the bones of the body, that means there must be some bone in your body that gets its nourishment only from gets. So what's a guy supposed to do? A guy comes home, says to his wife, you know, honey, it's been great uh, being with you, but you know, I'm missing the get bone. I'm missing the light of get. So I, I have to divorce you. I don't have a choice. Otherwise, I'm going to be in a state of chisarin. Now, any man that would make that statement would be committed simply you know, for, for insanity. Uh, that's an ab absolutely absurd statement. Well, isn't it also a, a mitzvah for him to remarry her after he divorced her? Well, it's considered to be proper, that's true. But on the other hand, number one, if he's a Kohen, he wouldn't be able to. And number two, it's, it's not in the 248. So I don't think there's a bone, remarriage bone, so to speak. So the answer must be that Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave us a tractate called Gittin, about get. So yeah, so the way I fulfill my get bone, so to speak, is by learning the laws of get, right? And in fact, in yeshiva, Mesechus Gittin is one of the most uh, commonly studied Mesechus. Uh, people spend a lot of time studying Gittin, um, even more than Kedushin. Kedushin is the marriage Mesechus, and Gittin is the divorce Mesechus. Okay, so these are the reasons why the Chavitz Chaim advocated the learning of Kachim. It's an affirmation in the coming of Mashiach. And number two, when we don't have a mitzvah that we can do, we need the neshama to be fed by the light that is generated from the learning of that mitzvah. Okay, but before we get into some comments on korbanos, <coughs> I just want to comment on the very first words of the Chumash, of, of Vayikra. Vayikra el Moshe. God calls to Moshe, Vayidaber Hashem a love, and Hashem speaks to him, may ohel moed, from the tent of meeting, which means the Mishkan. Now, the Rishayim already have a problem. What is the meaning of Vayikra? Throughout the Torah, when God speaks to Moshe, it always says almost the same thing. Vayidaber Hashem el Moshe. God speaks to Moshe. Why does it use here, before it says Vayidaber Hashem a love, it does say Vayidaber, but it prefaces Vayidaber with Vayikra el Moshe. And this doesn't appear anywhere else. So how do we understand this? 
So there is a machlokas, Rashi and Ramban, how to understand the significance of Vayikra. According to Rashi, although Vayikra only appears this one time, every single time when God spoke to Moshe, he wouldn't just begin talking to Moshe, he would call him by name and Moshe would acknowledge it. Vayikra el Moshe, meaning he called out Moshe. Moshe, Moshe. And Moshe would say, here I am. And then Hashem started talking. And even though Vayikra only appears here, Rashi says, the Torah said it once to teach me that every single time. This is the way Hashem spoke to Moshe. And indeed, Chazal Darshan, that generally speaking, when you start to talk to somebody, I mean, let's say somebody's walking and you're in back of them. Uh, the first thing you should do is call their name. You shouldn't just say, hey, what did you do about uh, the cleaning? No, the person is surprised. The person does, is not, not clear you're talking to them. So the Derech Eretz is, hey, Moshe, I want to tell you something. And then Moshe acknowledges, and then Hashem begins to talk. Otherwise, Moshe would almost be frightened. In the middle, Hashem starts talking. <coughs> so according to Rashi, the significance of Vayikra el Moshe is before Hashem began to speak to Moshe, he first called him by name. So remember these words, Kriyas Shem. Ramban has a very different analysis of the whole thing. And the Ramban says, in order to understand the beginning of Vayikra, you have to read the end of Shmos. The end of Shmos, last week's Parsha, the second of the two Parshios last week, uh, talks about the Mishkan was completed. And when the Mishkan was completed, it was enveloped by a cloud that represented the cloud of glory surrounding the Shekhinah. And inside the Mishkan was a glowing fire that again is the fire of God. And the Pasuk says, Lo Yacho Moshe Lavo. Moshe could not go in. Meaning he was not permitted to go in because the glory of God was there. So the Ramban says, that's exactly what Vayikra is saying. Hashem then calls to Moshe, Moshe, I give you Rishus to enter the Mishkan. And the Ramban points out, this is an exact parallel to Har Sinai itself. Go back to Parsha Yisro, Matan Torah. Mount Sinai was covered with a cloud of glory. And God called to Moshe to enter the cloud. The Ramban says, the Mishkan was a replication of Har Sinai. In other words, it's very Meduyat because it says at the end of Shmos, Moshe could not enter. Vayikra el Moshe is giving Moshe permission to enter the place of the Shekhinah, because that's how Moshe spoke to God. Moshe spoke to God <coughs> by entering the Mishkan. And indeed, Moshe went into the Kodesh Akdashim, and God would speak to him from between the cherubs. But Moshe needed permission to go in, and the permission is Vayikra. And then the Ramban says, unlike Rashi, who says every single time Hashem spoke to Moshe, he called his name, this is the one time. Moshe only needed once. Once he was given permission. He was authorized to come in anytime he wanted. In fact, Moshe could initiate. This is very unusual. Most Nevi'im, <coughs> they only receive messages from God. They can't go to God and say, I want to talk to you now. They have to wait for Hashem. Moshe could go to the Holy of Holies, and Moshe could say to God, I have a question, could you, answer, could you discuss it with me? Moshe could actually initiate those conversations. So 
to encapsulate the two opinions, according to Rashi, Vayikra el Moshe occurred every single time God spoke to Moshe. And the function was Kriyat Shem. According to the Ramban, <coughs> this was a one-time occurrence, giving Moshe permission to enter the Makam HaShchina. And once he was given permission, that permission uh, was covering him for the rest of his life. So the other times it only says, Vayidabar Hashem el Moshe Lamar. It didn't say Vayikra el Moshe because Moshe was already given permission to enter that area. <coughs> this is seemingly a technical machlokas. How do you understand Vayikra? But as is often the case, if you think about it a little bit more, you see that there are deep spiritual ideas behind even the most technical discussions in the Chumash. Let me start with Ramban first. Now you, you'll normally start with Rashi, but I'm going to start with Ramban, then move back to Rashi. <coughs> We've said many times, and the Svarim say many, many times, that the notion of Mishkan, tabernacle, corresponds to the idea that we have to make ourselves a tabernacle for Hashem. We ourselves are the Mishkan. We have to make a place for God in our heart and in our soul. <coughs> the Mishkan is a symbol of the Hashras Hashchina that has to be within us. That's why indeed at the very beginning of the construction of the Mishkan. The Pasuk says, V'yasu li mikdash. <coughs> Make for me a mikdash, a holy place. V'shachanti b'tocham. So I will dwell in them. In them, not in it. In them. So everything to do with the Malachat HaMishkan is connected on some level with making our heart and soul a dwelling place for God. So the Ramban is saying, Moshe needed permission to enter into that relationship with God. Meaning he couldn't just do it on his own. The lesson here is, if you want a relationship with God, you have to do it on God's terms, not on your terms. You need his permission. What does this mean? You know, God's terms are, of course, the Torah, the mitzvot, the halacha. Often you'll find people in society who seem to be deeply spiritual people. They want a relationship with God. But they don't feel, I'm talking about Jews now, but they don't feel that halacha is a mechanism for that relationship. They'll say things like, just, just examples, that, you know, just, I can't believe that the infinite God cares if I rip toilet paper on Shabbos, or if I turn on an electric light, or that I gotta say Kriya Shema by, you know, nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. In other words, it's often the case that the mystical spiritual temperament might actually find itself impatient with halachic minutiae. To use a highfalutin word, uh, this is what is called an antinomian tendency in mystical personalities. Antinomian just means I don't want rules, I don't want laws. I want to enjoy the fullness of my relationship with God without boundary without restriction, without limitation, without rules. And that's understandable and that's natural. But what the Ramban is teaching us is, you want to enter into a relationship with God, you need God's permission. Which is another way of saying, God tells you when and where and how. So, what you walk away with from this idea is that there is no such thing as genuine 
Jewish spirituality that's not connected to the observances of the Torah. You can't have a spirituality that is uncoupled. In fact, what, 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 what seems like spirituality might actually turn into narcissism. Self-worship. I do it because it makes me feel good. Is that serving God? Or is it serving me? So that's kind of the Ramban's message. How authentic spirituality has to be grounded in the details of Allah. Now, if this sounds uh, very obvious, well, number one, I'm not sure if it is very obvious, but the point is, but sometimes the reason ideas become obvious is precisely because earlier sources thoroughly discussed it. But this was a major, major issue in the beginning of the Hasidic movement. The Baal Shem Tov founded this spiritual movement that became known as Hasidus in the 18th century. And in the early years of Hasidus, in the Baal Shem Tov's lifetime, Hasidus was a very small movement. Uh, the, the, real, the real creator of Hasidus was the Baal Shem Tov's successor, Rav Dov Ber, the Maggid of Mezerich. I mean, Lahavdil, Gazillion Havdalos, the same way that the inventor of Christianity as a religion is not Jesus, but Paul. Lahavdil, 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 the real inventor of Hasidus is not the Baal Shem Tov, but it's the Maggid of Mezerich who made it into a huge, huge movement. And why Hasidus was invented, so to speak, why was it created, is a complicated question. I mean, I, I don't mean to suggest there's a single aspect to it. But part of it was connected to the idea that there was a sense that too much of religious Jewry were preoccupied with externalities, doing things right, but they didn't bring their heart, they didn't bring their emotion, they didn't bring their passion, they didn't develop love of Hashem as well as reverence for Hashem. So to speak, they didn't see the forest because they were so preoccupied with not only the trees but the branches of the trees. So Hasidus wanted to infuse a sense of panemius, internality, love of Hashem, fear of Hashem, fear meaning reverence of Hashem, and the like. So, that's certainly one of the, it's not, again, it's, it's a much more complicated issue, but one of the goals of Hasidus was to talk about Ava Hashem and Yira Hashem. A relationship with God as being something real, something tangible. In fact, I remember I was once talking about uh, having a relationship with God, and so somebody told me afterwards they felt very uncomfortable with those words. They sounded too Christian. Jews don't talk about, I was told, Jews do not talk about a relationship with God. They talk about a relationship with Torah, mitzvahs. Some truth to that. There is, because God is beyond us. But in a way, it's a shame. It is a shame. Because when you look at the mitzvahs as an end in and of itself, rather than a stepping stone to build a relationship, you're kind of missing the whole point. In fact, the Zohar says, very beautifully, that love of God and fear of God, meaning reverence of God, are the wings that bring your mitzvahs up to Shemayim. I do mitzvahs, but what brings them up is my avat Hashem and yirat Hashem. So, undoubtedly, one of the goals of Hasidus was to infuse Klau Yisrael with a sense of enthusiasm and love and passion and excitement and a direct feeling of a relationship with God. That sounds good. But every action has a reaction. Every positive has a negative. And there was a certain danger that lurked into the emphasis on spirituality and feeling and passion. That is, there were segments of Hasidus, not, not among the leaders, but among uh, the followers, in which they actually denigrated halachic detail. 
they said, you know, the most important thing is to love God and to, you know, f fear God. What's the difference if Zman Kriyashma is, let's say, nine o'clock? And I mean, let's imagine at nine o'clock I'm real tired and the Shema that I'll say will be superficial. Wouldn't Hashem much prefer that I sleep until 12 and then have a Geshmaka Kriyashma? Isn't the most important thing my emotion, my feeling, my passion? So there was a danger in early Hasidus, to use my highfalutin word again, of an antinomian rebellion against halachic rules. Now today, by and large, that's no longer the case, except in, in, in Zman Tefillah it still is, meaning today Hasidim are generally the strictest in halacha, but the antinomian tendencies of early Hasidus still survive in the various compromises that are made in terms of how late they daven. That's kind of a Yerusha from the early Hasidus. Again, I'm not going to defend, I'm not going to criticize either. I'm just noting that obviously they're davening after Zman Tefillah, after Zman Kriyashma, <coughs> and everything else. So you see, life is like a seesaw here. Because when you concentrate on spirituality, you get impatient with halachic minutiae. When you fixate on halachic minutiae, you're too busy like measuring, you know, your kazayas on a sheet of paper for Pesach and not thinking about how this connects you to God. <coughs> so as a result, there is this push-pull in, in which you need both. But sometimes one becomes predominant and it needs to be corrected. <coughs> so indeed, <coughs> in the second generation of Hasidus, <coughs> we have the famous Misnagate book, the Misnagate response to Hasidus, the Nefesh Achayim of Rav Chaim Velazhner, the Vilna Gaon's disciple. And people don't realize this, although the Nefesh Achayim has many, many, many wonderful things having nothing to do with this particular debate. But if you were to ask why was the Nefesh Achayim written, it's very, very clear that Rav Chaim Velazhner was writing it to dispel some of the beliefs of Hasidus that were spreading throughout Europe. And in particular, the idea that halachic detail is not important. Nefesh Achayim makes the point. Kavanas are great. Love of God is great. Fear of God is great. But if you don't do the Misa the way Hashem wants it, then all of your Kavanas are not going to take you anywhere. And although he doesn't mention Hasidus in the book at all, but it's clear that that's what he's addressing. <coughs> Interestingly, <coughs> The same thing happened in the Hasidic movement itself. A few years before the Nefesh HaChayim, the Alter Rebbe published Tanya. In fact, uh, the last of Abhijah Rebbe claims that the Nefesh HaChayim was influenced by Tanya. I'm not sure, but you know, anything is possible. And the Tanya really makes the same point. That's why people don't realize that Tanya was a controversial work, not only vis-a-vis -vis non hasidim It was quite uh, controversial in the Hasidic world itself. Many of the contemporary Hasidic uh, rabbis did not like the Tanya for a few reasons. Number one, Rav Schneer Zalman was trying to make Kabbalah accessible to the average Hasid, because Tanya incorporates many Kabbalistic insights. And the other Hasidic Rebbe's, many of them felt that Kabbalah should only be for the Rebbe, it should not be for the Hasidim. That's why it's called Chabad, because it was a very intellectually based Hasidus. <coughs> and number two, the Alter Rebbe, who himself was not only a Hasid, but he was also a great, great Gon in Shas and Poskim and Shulchan Aruch, talked very much about the importance of Halacha. And that was thought to be a shtickle betrayal. Now, it's interesting that uh, eventually, even in the Hasidic world, except for maybe Zman Tfila, the Nefesh Shechayim and the Balatanya's approach did take root, and Hasidus became very deeply committed to halachic detail 
So it's interesting, you take a guy like Martin Buber, you know, Martin Buber uh, put together, Martin Buber was very uh, fascinated by early Hasidus. He put together two volumes called Tales of Hasidim. That's the English name, he wrote it, he did it in German. But he only did the first two or three generations. Because from his perspective, after the first three generations, Hasidus betrayed its roots by becoming too officially orthodox. <laughs> Meaning Buber didn't like the fact that Hasidus gravitated back to halachic roots. He enjoyed when it was like a Hefkerveld, where people were doing whatever they wanted to do. That was his ideal. But nevertheless, uh, this is the issue. So going back to the Ramban. So when the Ramban tells us that before Moshe could enter the presence of the divine, he had to do it with God's terms. He needed God's rishus. I believe that that essentially highlights what Rav Chaim of Volazhin is arguing in Nefesh HaChaim. A relationship to God must be, with God, must be predicated on HaKadosh Baruch Hu's rules. You can't make up your own game. You can't make up your own private deal with HaKadosh Baruch And that's the significance of Rishas. By the way, Rav Chaim Velazhner gives an example. It's almost a humorous example. <coughs> it's Nogea Pesach. So let's imagine Pesach is coming up. I, well, let's not imagine. Pesach is coming up. And uh, you've been working very, very hard, particularly the women work so hard to prepare for Pesach. And by the time the Seder comes, you are dead tired. You are dead tired. You're going to be sleeping through the Seder and your, your mind is not going to function and it's not going to be an inspiring experience at all, so you think. So let's imagine a person would say, you know, I tell you what, we've been working for a month on Pesach. Let's go to bed early Wednesday night. <coughs> let's go to sleep. Skip the Seder. And then the next day or two days, will make the most magnificent, beautiful Seder you can imagine <coughs> when we're well, well rested. Now that would be an absurdity. Because yeah, you have a beautiful Seder, but it's not God's Seder. It's not God's rules. So it's interesting, just to show you that life imitates art. I, I once gave this example in a share about the absurdity. So I was, like saying, I was saying it's so self-evidently absurd. Imagine the absurdity of making a Seder you know, two days later. So a woman, non-religious woman, raised her hand and said, you know, we did that exactly last year. We couldn't get the family in for Pesach. So nobody could get tickets till after Pesach, not the next day, after Pesach. So we made the Seder a week later. It was great. It was fantastic. Well, all I can say is, I'm sure the family gathering was great. And I'm sure the family gathering was fantastic, but it ain't a Seder. That much, that much for sure is the case. It's not a, in fact, if they would have waited a month, maybe they at least could have called it Pesach Sheni Seder. Okay, <laughs> but this is like, you know, <coughs> too early for Pesach Sheni, <coughs> too late for Pesach Rishon. <coughs> so that is what emerges, I think, from Ramban. But now, let's go back to Rashi's point of Vayikra. The same way that a movement like Hasidus had latent dangers of antinomianism and disparagement of halachic detail, just like today, a person who is very spiritual might not really care about all of these rules. When you're a rule-oriented, obedient person, keeping the mitzvahs, there is the risk and danger of acting like a robot, of acting without passion, without excitement, without thinking about Hashem. I don't think about Hashem, I think about the size of the matzah. I think about this rule, and this rule, and this rule, and this rule, without thinking where this is taking me. And <coughs> a person becomes a victim of an unthinking conformity, as opposed to developing the uniqueness of their relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So I would suggest that this is the second aspect 
that Rashi is bringing in. When you want to have a relationship with God, God calls you by your name. Right? Ramban fo focused on you need permission to enter. Rashi says when you enter, you're given a name. What was that? Um, there used to be a TV show, Cheers, I think. Yeah. Uh, so was it? Uh, you like to go to a place where everybody knows your name. So a name represents the singularity of a person, the individuality of a person. God is saying, I did give the Jewish people a common mission, the mitzvahs. But that's just the floor, that's not the ceiling. You have these common responsibilities. Men, women, I mean, they, they may be different, but, but all of us have these, these common mitzvahs. But God says, you must strive to develop a unique, individualistic relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Focusing on your talents, on your abilities, on your emotions, on your feelings, on your creativity. And in truth, you need both Rashi and Ramban's perspectives here. If all you have is Rashi, you have narcissistic new age spirituality where you simply focus on whatever makes you feel good. If all you have is Ramban's ethic of obedience, then you become superficial and stilted. But you combine Ramban and Rashi in terms of Ayikra, we have these two in Yonim of how we become true servants of God and children of God by obeying his commandments and living within his structure and at the same time exercising our creativity, our individuality, our uniqueness. That we're not just a Jew among other Jews. We're not just a human among other humans. But we are a Moshe. We are an Avram. We are a Yitzchak. We are an Esther. We are a Devorah. We stand before God as individuals with discrete and unique and irreplaceable identities. And that's the significance of Hashem calling your name. Now here, of course, there are some very, very famous Hasidic stories. Uh, one of the great Hasidic, early Hasidic rabbis, who was a friend of the Alter Rebbe, was Rabbi Zusha of Anipole. Hanapole was, was simply his town. And uh, Rav Zusha said many things. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you two Rav Zusha stories. Uh, both of them are, are pretty well known. Uh, one story of Rav Zusha was that somebody asked the Mezerich or Magid, Rav Dov Bear of Mezerich, who was the successor to the Baal Shem Tov. I don't understand the Mishnah in Maseches Brachos that says you must bless God for the bad with the same enthusiasm that you bless him for the good. Be makabel v'simcha. I don't understand how a person could uh, be makabel this v'simcha. So the Maggid of Mezerich said, go to my Talmud Rav Zusha. He will explain it. So he goes to Rav Zusha, and Rav Zusha is living in abject poverty, and the kids don't have shoes, and water is going through the roof, and there's no food in the house. And he goes to Rav Zusha and he says, you know, the Magid sent me to you. And he asked me to ask you, Akasha, how can a person accept the bad that God sends him with the same enthusiasm as the good? He said, you can give me a teret. So Rav Zusha looked very confused. And Rav Zusha said, I really don't understand. Nothing bad ever happened to me. So that was kind of the, the answer uh, to that question. Uh, but the other statement of Rezusha is a very, very famous statement. That he said, I am not afraid after I die that God is going to ask me why wasn't I Avram Avinu? Because I'm not Avram. Why wasn't I Moshe? I'm not Moshe. What I'm really afraid of is, why weren't you Zusha? God had a role for Zusha. And Zusha felt that perhaps he was not fulfilling that role. 
And that's the question that each and every one of us asks. God is calling us by name. Right, so the po point of this is simply to show that even in a technical machlokas of Mephorshim, there are often going to be deep spiritual meanings behind all of this. Now, let me speak a little bit about korbanos themselves. Uh, obviously, korbanos are a big deal because the Torah has so many psukim devoted to korbanos. There are many more verses devoted to korbanos than to Shabbos, than to Kashrus, than to Taira Tamishpacha. Right? So it, there is a big deal here. So what's going on? I mean, does God like barbecued meat? So there's a big, big machlokas between the Rambam, Maimonides, and Ramban, Nachmanides, as well as other commentaries. The Rambam, Maimonides, writes in the Mori Nebuchim, the guy to the perplexed, <coughs> that intrinsically, God doesn't want korbanos. No, God cares about goodness, God cares about righteousness, God cares about charity, and God cares about intellectually developing yourself so you can connect to him by uh, trying to understand his ways through the Torah and through science as well. But God doesn't care about meat. But when the Jewish people were idolatrous pre-Matan Torah in Mitzrayim, they were very, very attracted to the cult of sacrifices. Sacrifices were a very vivid ceremonial aspect of religious life. Not only, in, not only animal sacrifice, but indeed even human sacrifice. It was something that people got very excited about. So if God were to simply tell us to go cold turkey and renounce our attachment to animal sacrifices, we wouldn't have been able to do it and we would have remained connected to idolatry. So in order to disengage us from idolatry, God tolerated a certain concession by, by allowing us to borrow from Avodazara <coughs> those rituals that made the strongest impression on us. <coughs> and therefore, Korbanos are considered to be a concession to the idolatrous impulses within the people. This is what the Rambam writes in the Guide to the Perplexed. Nachmanides, Ramban, has many, 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 many questions with the Rambam. Number one, we find that Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov brought korbanos. They, they built altars. We find Cain and Hevel at the very beginning of the world, right? And it says, and God accepted Hevel's offering because he brought from the best. <coughs> and I would add <coughs> that the Rambam himself writes that there are going to be korbanos when Mashiach comes. And in our Musaf prayer, we pray for the reinstitution of korbanos. Why is that so? Why do we pray for the restoration of the Beis HaMikdash? Karbanos were a, something God tolerated, <coughs> but not that he desired. So because of this, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> because of, I'm sorry, could you bring, uh, oh, I have some water, okay, I'll take this. Uh, because of this, Ramban understands korbanos in a very different way. He agrees that God doesn't care about the meat. But korbanos are beautiful when they effect a transformation of the sinner who brings the korban. I bring the korban, I realize that there but for the grace of God should go me. I become submissive. I become humbled. I do tshuva. So when the Torah says a korban <coughs> is a reach nichoach, a pleasant fragrance to God, 
it does not refer to the physical smell of the meat. It refers, metaphorically, that when I have become changed because of my korbanas, that is something pleasant in the eyes of God. So the korban is important, not as a concession to my avodazara inclination. The korban is important as a vehicle of self-transformation. That's the Ramban's very beautiful thesis. And this actually explains a very interesting anomaly. On one hand, the Torah itself makes a big deal about korbanos. On the other hand, uh, it is a well-known idea, it cannot be denied, that the Nevi'im knock korbanos all the time. Uh, you look at Yeshayo, you look at Yermiyo, uh, so Yeshayo says, Lama li rovs of chechem. Who needs your korbanos? Who needs it? You think God cares? You slaughter a, something in the base of Mikdash, you think that matters? Who needs it? That the reform movement made a whole pilpul about this. They differentiate between priestly religion, which focuses on ritual, and prophetic religion that focuses on social action. And they say, the prophets rejected the ritualism of the Torah. Which obviously is not true because the Nevi'im talk about Karbanas as well in a positive way. But they do not Karbanas. So why do they knock Karbanas? For a very simple reason. Like the Ramban, there's a perfectly beautiful explanation why they knock Karbanas. In paganism, there was also Karbanas, right? Karbanas. What was the function of sacrifices in a pagan religion, Greece, Rome? It was in the nature of mafia protection money. You brought a sacrifice to Zeus so he, he would help you beat this other guy, or at least give him a sacrifice so he's not going to hurt you and help the other guy. You were simply bribing. There was no concept that the Corbin helped you become a better person, because frankly, Zeus, who doesn't exist anyway, Zeus didn't care if you were a better person, because certainly Zeus was like the worst guy who ever lived anyway. I mean, the notion that the Greek gods, and I'm not saying there weren't any moral Greeks, there probably were, but it wasn't because of their religion. The concept that, you know, whether it's Zeus or Apollo or, Mer or whoever these guys are, or these women are, that they cared whether you were a righteous person, that's absurd. You see, this is a very interesting point. We're so used to the idea that religion and morality are related. And that is true today in every religion, in theory. That we don't realize that this was Judaism's invention. In paganism, there was no linkage between morality and religion. Religion was paying off the gods. Morality was whatever you thought was moral. There was no concept of the gods require that I be moral. I mean, that's absurd. I mean, Zeus was not in a position. I don't want to go over the, all the things Zeus did. Again, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not saying he, he was, well, there was no such thing, but the stories of Zeus, he was not very interested in moral behavior. So here's what the Ramban is saying. Here's what the Nevi'im are saying. If I bring a korban, but instead of changing me, I continue to cheat in business, and I persecute the widow and the orphan, then what has happened is, not only is my korban meaningless, it now becomes sinful. Because what I'm trying to do is bribe God. You think you can bribe God by giving him meat? What is that about? See, that's why they single out korbanos, meaning when the korban changes you, that's a beautiful thing. And that's what the Torah is talking about. When the Corbin doesn't change you, you're treating God like the Godfather. <laughs>
right? Literally, yeah, you're, you're paying him off like a, like a mafia. In fact, even the godfather was, was offended when they offered him a bribe, right? So, uh, and offer him, uh, offer him a bribe. So this is an interesting machlokas, Ramban and Rambam. So the Meshech Chachma, Rav Meir Simcha Cohen of Devinsk, actually tries to offer a very ingenious compromise position. Uh, which, in other words, neither opinion agrees with his position, but he wants to adopt a position in the middle. <coughs> And he wants to say that certainly the korbanos that are brought in the Beis Hamikdash or the Mishkan, they have a deeply spiritual transformative effect on the worshiper. And potentially they bring him closer to God. In other words, he follows Ramban for the korbanos of the Beis Hamikdash. <coughs> but the korbanos that are brought on Bamot. Now, let, 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 I have to give a little background here. A bama, <coughs> the plural is bamot or bamos, are private altars that somebody could build in their backyard. Now, let me explain something about bamos. Most of the time, the way the halachic system works, when we have a centralized sanctuary, we are not allowed to bring private bamos. That's why in the Book of Kings it says over and over again, people were sinning because they continued to bring sacrifices on the bamos. That's bamos to God. <coughs> However, what usually happens was when the temple gets destroyed or the Mishkan gets destroyed. So for example, we came to Eretz Yisrael. <coughs> the Mishkan was set up in Shiloh. And it was there for 350 years. During those 350 years, the Bamos were prohibited. Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines. And it was 52 years until we had Shlomo's temple. For those 52 years, Bamos were permitted. Once the temple in Jerusalem is built, the Bamos become forbidden. Once the first temple is destroyed, the Bamos become permitted. Ah, but now, when the second temple is built, the Bamos become prohibited. When the second temple is destroyed, the Bamos are still prohibited. That's otherwise I could build a Bama. So, if you're doing pattern recognition here, you, you realize there's something wrong with this pattern. Because the pattern normally is <coughs> when you have temple mishkan, private altars are forbidden. When you don't have temple mishkan, <coughs> private altars are permitted. That happened after the korban of Shiloh. And that happened after the korban of the first base of Mikdash. But what's the big exception? After the korban of the second Beis HaMikdash, like today, Bamot are forbidden. For Jews, for Jews. I'll talk about non-Jews in, in a second. So says the Meshach like this. Unlike the korbanos of the Beis HaMikdash, that totally transform you and elevate you, korbanos on a Bama is a toleration that God made for the Yetzirah of idolatry, like the Ramba. In other words, if we didn't have korbanos, we would gravitate to idolatry. Now, the Gemara in Yuma says, at the beginning of the second Beis HaMikdash, the men of the Great Assembly fasted that God should take away our Yetzirah for idolatry. That's why we don't have that Yetzirah anymore. So therefore, it stands to reason that even after the Chorban, Bamas are not going to be permitted because the only reason to permit them would have been to feed the Yetzirah of Avayda Zorah. 
Now, the there's a lot to talk about, and I, I do want to talk about it. Maybe I'll, I'll save it. Uh, the nature of the HR of idolatry, what, what does it represent, and the like. But the Meshachach says, with his hypothesis, you can actually explain the halachic anomaly that after the Chorban Bayasheni, Bamot are still forbidden, because without the HR of Avodah there's no reason to permit the Bamot. Now, interestingly, although it is absolutely halakhically the case that we are not allowed to bring a korban on a bama today, that's 100% clear, but that only applies to Jews. It does not apply to non-Jews. Non-Jews are allowed to bring sacrifices to Hashem on a bama even when there's a Beis HaMikdash. They could do it. So, Kalvachomer, when there's no Beis HaMikdash. So, as a result, there have been some rabbis that have called uh, on encouraging non-Jews to go to the Mount of Olives and bring animal sacrifices. Now, even they say it's not a chiv, it's not an obligation, they say it's a permission. But here's the thing. Once something is a permission and not an obligation, um, it's appropriate to use common sense, whether it's a good idea or not. I mean, not everything you can do you should do. And there's a lot of reasons why this is not a good idea. Uh, one reason why it's not a good idea is it would create great confusion among Jews. Because if a Jew sees a guy could bring a korban on the Mount of Olives, then how can I not bring a korban on the Mount of Olives? I mean, what's, gonna, what's going on? The guy can do things I can't do. And the other reason is that, once again, uh, you know, uh, our Arab uh, friends will see korbanos in, in at least proximity to the Temple Mount, and they'll think that it's somehow a scheme to rebuild the temple, and that could cause all sorts of complications. So I think a majority of, of Rabbanim uh, are not encouraging this, and they feel it's not necessarily a good idea, it may be a very dangerous idea. But, but uh, the one thing I cannot deny, if you ask me the question, how halachically, is a non-Jew allowed to bring a korban on his own private altar? The halacha is, yes, he can. And if you ask, may a Jew bring a korban on a bama? The answer is a Jew cannot. I mean, so the halacha is clear, even though it's not always clear to us why we have those distinctions. Okay, so we'll stop here and thank you and uh, shavu atov. And good Shabbos. Yeah, it's your